The destroyer that would come to be known as Tashkent, or Project 20, started life in the mid-1930s when Soviet leaders were looking at foreign warships to see what advances could be collectivised for the benefit of the party and people, particularly to provide a class to, to follow on from the Leningrad class flotilla leaders, which in their own turn had taken inspiration from the French contre torpilleurs this desire for big, fast and powerful ships led to the basic specifications the Leningrad's design team had come up with being used as the basis for design requests from Italian yards, as the Esploratori large destroyers and the Condottieri small cruisers seemed to indicate the Italians were quite comfortable with the idea of ships that sat between conventional destroyers and cruisers in size, and they're also dab hand at making such vessels move very fast. Perhaps more practically, they were also willing to sell their services to a third party like the USSR. The idea was for the Italian yards to build a single ship and then help the Soviets redistribute the means of production to their own yards. The goals were a little ambitious, consisting of slamming almost as much horsepower as that found in a Dunkirk-class battlecruiser into a ship less than one-ninth of the displacement at just over 2,800 tonne standard displacement, in order to achieve just over 42 knots and thus gain the useful universal answers to all things destroyer. And pick up a bunch of speeding tickets if it ever found itself barreling down an urban freeway in a number of US states. In order to actually go anywhere with this hilarious power plant, it would need to carry just over 42%, you know, that number keeps coming up again, of its standard displacement as fuel leading to, along with a few other items, a deep load displacement of just under 4,200 tonnes. The armament wasn't planned to be light either. Three twin turrets carrying 130mm guns, along with a half dozen 45mm and the same number of 12.7mm anti-aircraft guns, and nine torpedo tubes in three triple launchers plus mine laying capabilities were sought. The Italian Otto Company won the design contest and got to work in January 1937, turning out a ship that, after launch at the end of uh, the same year, ended up making 43.5 knots on trials a few months later, with it being anticipated that with a few minor tweaks she'd actually make over 44.5 knots. Unfortunately it turned out the Italians had done too good a job and the complete change in Soviet shipyard techniques that would be needed to allow them to replicate the design turned out to be far too complex, and so when she entered Soviet service, officially in May 1939, she would be the only ship of her type to fly the Soviet flag. Arriving in the Black Sea with three single 130mm guns, the ship would still need some work to be done to it. The delayed twin mounts were only delivered and installed in 1941 with German tanks massing on the Soviet border. The dockyard visit was also used to swap out the hilariously bad 45mm anti-aircraft guns for 37mm weapons, which were somewhat better. She was then assigned to fire support missions near Odessa, where at the end of August 1941 she was bombed by the Luftwaffe. Whilst no direct hits were scored, the near misses were quite powerful and numerous enough to cripple the ship and distort parts of the hull. An estimate of five months of repairs was shortened to a month and a half by an inventive engineer named Krintinsky, who sourced a series of powerful hydraulic jacks, lifted the ship up right there in the dry dock and set to work on repairs, during which time a twin three-inch anti-aircraft mount was stuck on the ship's stern to improve her defence against further air attacks. By this point, Sevastopol was being encircled, so, along with other ships, Tashkent fell back and re-entered the shore bombardment and support game, with a quick break in early 1942 to carry supplies to her former home base. The combination of size and sheer speed being seen as helpful in this regard, although she was probably too heavily loaded and took a fair bit of damage from water breaking over the bow as a result. By May, though, the situation in Sevastopol was getting desperate and Tashkent, along with other ships, was refocused on the transport of men and supplies going in and wounded and civilians coming out. She proved very good at this job, repeating the run a number of times with great success, until on the 26th of June 1942, in company with the destroyer Bezuprechny, she was attacked by dozens of Luftwaffe aircraft, her companion took a direct hit, broke in two, and sank. Tashkent made it to Sevastopol and took on 2,000 wounded and other evacuees, heading back out in the early morning hours on the 27th. 
Around local dawn, more German aircraft appeared, and after a long, drawn-out struggle and taking out a few of her attackers, she was again subject to a number of damaging near misses. Still, the tough little ship carried on, limping into the arms of a rescue flotilla and making it back to port under tow. Unfortunately, that would be her last voyage, as even whilst the decorations for the ship and crew were coming in a few days later, German bombers appeared overhead and finally, with the ship stationary, managed to land a pair of direct hits, which sank her in place. Novorossik, the port that she was based at, was later overrun by German troops before being retaken in 1943, and salvage operations commenced. But whilst eight months of work got her back up again, the damage to the hull was considered too great to repair, and after moving her away from the berth for storage, she was left on a sandbar with the hulk scrapped at the end of the war. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.